good morning to the other people from all around the world. So let me start by sharing my screen. And okay, no, let me share. Oh, desktop, and then let me go. My presentation. Uh, so this is actually the second part uh, uh, models of disease um, ecology. And uh, as you may remember, uh, today is devoted to the, the general topic of macroparasites. Uh, um, so a brief introduction to the basics. Uh, and then I will illustrate our work on schistosomiasis um, in, um, in Senegal. So uh, you may remember this slide where I, I introduced micro and macro parasites, so the difference in terms of modeling and uh, macro parasites with respect to micro are characterized by lifetime, which is comparable to their host's lifetime. So their dynamics cannot be neglected. Also, of course, they are larger macro parasites, so you can uh, actually count them uh, in a way in many cases. So you, you can look at the, the load of the parasites uh, inside each host uh, and uh, count uh, the number of uh, parasites. Now, the, the, the life cycles uh, I am uh, going to consider, well, the one on the left is the simple, the simple cycle. Um, for instance, the um, a roundworm or a, a nematode, and you see that uh, um, um, that pig is ingesting the eggs, uh, and then the eggs will develop inside uh, uh, the pig, uh, and then they will become adult, uh, and they uh, will produce uh, more eggs, uh, and then. Uh, um, these eggs will be defecated in the environment and then the infection goes on that way with another pig uh, eating the eggs and so on and so on. On the right, you have a more complex uh, life cycle, which is actually um, the also um, the life cycle of schistosomiasis, um, of which I am going to speak uh, later on, because in that case, you have two hosts. So you have um, the human host, or in, uh, in this case, the cattle. And um, in that case, um, it is uh, different. There is a stage called the circarial stage. And um, this stage will uh, penetrate, in general, the skin of the host. So we'll get inside the host, and then uh, again, uh, uh, the adults will develop inside the host uh, and then they will reproduce inside the host, uh, the main host, I mean, in, in a way. And then uh, eggs will be produced. The egg, these eggs will actually hatch and produce another stage with a called miracidium. And uh, this miracidia will actually infect another host, uh, a snail, in this case, in, this, in the case of Fasciolopsis buski. And um, so uh, in the, then the, 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 there are other stages inside, uh, inside the snails. And then finally, the snails will uh, release the miracidia and the cercaria, and then the, the cycle will go on. But without the snails, uh, um, the, the disease cannot establish. And on the other hand, without the cattle, without the human host, the, the, the disease cannot establish its snail either. So they are necessary. Both, uh, both hosts are necessary. And we will uh, first start, of, obviously, from the simple life cycle. And uh, then we will proceed to the more complex uh, life cycle. So first of all, I, I told you that in, uh, in, in ma macroparasites, in many cases, you can count them. And here you see um, four examples. Uh, so for instance, uh, the, the perch, and this is a tapeworm inside the perch, and you can count the burden. So some of the perches have zero parasites, some have one, one parasite, some have two parasites, and so on and so on, okay. 
Now you can do the same with a completely different parasite. In this case, it is a, a fly, a stinging fly, and these are uh, the reindeer. And of course, in, in this case, the number of parasite roast is, is much larger. And so, uh, well, what you do, you do a histogram. And uh, again, you see that there are some uh, reindeer without any parasite and then, uh, okay, you, you bin the number of parasites in your that histogram. Uh, uh, here it is instead a, a starling, and in, in that case it is a nematode, and also it is a nematode for, for the frogs. Um, and you see that the, the, the histogram of the parasite burden uh, is it, quite burden, it's quite, quite uh, this burden is quite, quite different. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the shape, the kind, the kind of, of shape, and in some cases you, you uh, see, for instance, typically in the case of frog, what we call an over dispersion with uh, a few hosts carrying a lot of parasites and, and many hosts without any parasite. Okay, so that, that, uh, that uh, typical, typical structure of the word in, in many cases. So it would be nice to, to find um, a way to statistically describe the, this burden. And um, um, well, the first thing you, you might think about is the, uh, for instance, a, a simple uh, binomial distribution where R, the number of parasites and you, uh, uh, P is the probability of having parasite, uh, hosting a parasite. And uh, well, you know, the binomial distribution is characterized actually by under, this, what we call under dispersion, because if we consider the mean and the variance, then the variance is smaller than the mean, smaller or equal. It is equal to uh, the mean uh, when you go to the limit for uh, the number of trials going to infinity and the probability of hosting the parasite going to zero so that n times p converges to a constant. And then you have a Poisson distribution. In the Poisson distribution, the mean is equal to the variance. Uh, but actually, in many, in, uh, in, in many cases, uh, you don't have um, variance equal to the mean, but you have a variance which is larger than the mean. That's why uh, usually the most appropriate distribution is the, the negative uh, binomial. Uh, it is more flexible. Of course, it has uh, one more parameter with uh, respect to, uh, to the binomial or if you like, and the, uh, the Poisson distribution. And uh, um, it is this parameter K, which is a parameter of clumping, and the smaller is K and uh, the larger the over dispersion. Because in, 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 uh, in fact, you, 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 you can prove that the variance is equal to the mean plus the square of the mean divided by this parameter K. So you see that if this parameter is very large, uh, practically you have Poisson distribution with a variance equal to to the mean, then with k equal to five, you have an, an aggregated distribution. Um, and you, you may remember that, uh, uh, for instance, well, I say this one is kind of aggregated, k equal to one in this case. And um, well, uh, for instance, k um, is it's more than one, you have a highly aggregated uh, distribution. So it, it is um, very, very popular, let's say, to use a negative dynamic distribution as a flexible uh, distribution with just two parameters. That you, that you, if you adjust these two parameters, you can reasonably fit um, the parasite load. And that would be useful for the simple model I am going to show uh, to you. So it is a simple model where you have a simple uh, cycle. Um, 
where you have the host number or the host uh, density, if you like number, for instance, of pigs per uh, square kilometer or number of deer per square kilometer. And P is the adult parasite number or uh, density, if you like. Of course, the parasite burden, what I want to call is P divided by H in the average. So total number of parasites divided by total number of hosts, and that will give you the average, the average burden. But actually, each host uh, might have a different, might host a different number of, of parasites, zero, one, two, three, etc. So now let me also introduce the number of uh, free living stages, for instance, larvae or eggs, if you like, and then we can write down uh, two differential equation, one for the host and one for the parasite. And then uh, the one for the host will be the birth rate minus the death rate times the host no disease, but if there is a disease, then what happens? Well, let's first suppose that uh, if you carry a lot of parasites, your mortality is larger. So let me call alpha the additional mortality caused by one parasite. So if you carry I parasites, there is an extra mortality alpha I. Now, if you consider the whole population and you consider the distribution PI, probability that one host um, carries I parasites, you see that this is actually the um, average mortality and then you multiply by H and then you have the dynamics for the host. As for the parasites, well, uh, each host might, uh, you know, ingest a certain number of larvae, of larvae, then the parasite will have their own, um, let's say, intrinsic natural uh, death rate. But there's another thing, anytime a host dies, also all the parasites that are carried by the host will also die. And so you have to uh, consider the more mu plus uh, some alpha IPI and uh, that uh, you, it should be included, should be included uh, in, uh, in, in this equation. Now notice that here you multiply by IPI because whenever a host dies, all the I parasites that are hosted by uh, that host will also die. Okay, so that's the, the equation. Now, okay, you can, we can now um, calculate the parasite load. Well, PI, P divided by H is the mean. And then you may uh, note that if you develop this term now, okay, it involves also the, uh, sorry, the um, square, no, sorry, the mean of the square, of the I square. Well, so you may remember that it is the, the square of the mean plus the variance. Now, if we assume negative binomial, then the square of the mean plus variance can actually derived from the uh, formula that I showed to you before. And so it, it turns out that uh, it is P divided by H plus K plus one divided by K. K, remember the clumping parameter, and when the clumping parameter is low, then there is a lot of over distribution times P squared divided by H squared. So to make it short, you can get Anderson and uh, May's model, provided you also introduce uh, um, a, a static equation for the larvae, where if there are many adult parasites, they will produce a lot of larvae. But on the other hand, if there are a lot of hosts around, they will ingest the larvae and therefore the number of larvae in the environment will be lower. Actually, you can deduct this kind of, uh, find this kind of uh, static relationship. Uh, uh, if you also could add another differential equation for the larvae dynamics, and you assume that the larvae dynamics is so fast that in practice, you can uh, use the uh, a, a slow, fast uh, approach uh, um, um, 
and then uh, okay, you get this static relationship for the larvae. Now, if you plug everything in, you get uh, the uh, celebrated uh, um, Anderson and Mays model, um, which is in practice, it's a simple system of two differential equations, H and P, um, which is closed under the hypothesis that the larvae have uh, this uh, describe this relationship and that the distribution the distribution of uh, the parasite burden actually follows a um, negative binomial distribution. Now, if you study the, uh, the um, system of differential equation as usual, for instance, by drawing the isoc lines or linearizing whatever you want, then you find out that again, you can define a basic uh, reproduction number. And uh, in a way, the recipe is always the same. So one divided by M plus mu plus alpha, this is the residence time in the, uh, in the infectious, uh, infectious stage. And um, um, this uh, actually is the number of, uh, say, parasites uh, that are ingested in, in unit time. Okay. Now, as usual, R not equal to one marks a uh, transcritical bifurcation because you know uh, these green eyes of line can be shaped in this way, and, and, and this is the, of course the case of R not larger than one. So there is an endemic equilibrium which is stable, but then of course it can also be shaped in this way that I is a in, in that case, R not is more than one. So again, uh, we see a uh, simple uh, transcritical bifurcation with R not equal to one marking uh, the, the boundary and the, the, when it, you switch uh, and they, uh, you have a bifurcation at R not equal to one. Now, what is interesting that you might now say, well, that is true if the parasites are going to affect the mortality of their hosts. There is a very interesting study, and I, maybe you remember that I introduced that, that, that show the uh, red grouse to you at the very beginning of part one. And um, uh, my good friends, uh, uh, Andy Dobson and, uh, and, um, and, and, and Pete Hudson, uh, now they observed that actually the red grouse have an oscillatory behavior. It is also to be able. Okay, and uh, they carry these um, intestinal parasite trichostrongylus teres. Now, how is it possible? How is it possible to describe such a behavior? Because in this case, you, you do not get any permanent oscillation. Now, what they observed actually is that the parasites do not affect so much the mortality, they affect the fertility, the reproductive success uh, of, the, of the red grouse. So let me now introduce that uh, kind of, um, of um, hypothesis. And you see that in, in this case, mortality is, is not affected by, by um, by uh, the parasites, but it is the uh, fertility new, which is actually decreased. And the larger the number of parasites that one host carries and the larger the decrease in, in, uh, in, uh, in fertility. And then of course the parasite will die uh, from their own mortality, but they will also die when the host dies and the host dies with mortality mu, which is the interesting mortality. Now, if you go to the, this equation, this equation actually appear in a way simpler uh, with respect to the previous one. Notice that here you don't have to assume any negative binomial. Okay, you still have to assume that the larvae are uh, described by the static relationship. Um, when you study this very simple system of equation, what you get is, is something like that. And again, you have, uh, you know, this is the, uh, an isocline and this is the other locus with the other isoclines. And fine. Okay, now the expression for R0 is this one. Now you don't have uh, 
alpha, which was the mortality induced by uh, the parasites, the host. Uh, and, you know, what is interesting, if you look at um, the um, number of hosts at the equilibrium, okay, now if R0 is larger than one, you have anyway an intersection. Uh, of course, R0 might be smaller than one. If R0 is smaller than one, this isocline is actually placed here. So you don't have any intersection, any interesting intersection. So you don't have a, a, a known trivial equilibrium. So R0 less than one, and you have only the disease free equilibrium. As usual, at R0 equal to one, there is a transcritical bifurcation. When this H star is exactly equal to K, then you have transcritical bifurcation. But what is interesting that if H star is actually smaller, much smaller than K, and you can actually prove that, that when it is smaller than uh, K divided by two, you have a Hopf bifurcation. So um, um, this equilibrium is no longer uh, asymptotically stable, it becomes unstable and surrounded by a limit cycle. So you see here, uh, what I told you, uh, that in, you can have half uh, uh, bifurcation in, in this case. Now, note that uh, K, the carrying capacity, so the density of the, of the host, as usual, is influencing R0, so the more dense the population, the larger the carrying capacity and the larger R0. So you can make R0 uh, larger than one and um, you have a, 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 an endemic disease because of, okay, uh, so the epidemics can reasonable, easily establish when the population is very, very high. So, Think of cattle raising or pig raising in a, in, in a farm. And so they're there. They so of course, uh, it's easy to, to get a disease there. But if you look at the H star, H star does not depend on carry capacity. So R0 can be larger than one, but it very much depends on the parasite fertility. So for increasing parasite fertility, you see H star is decreasing and therefore you have First a transcritical and then a hop uh, bifurcation. Okay. Now it's time to go to um, schistosomiasis. Uh, no, first let me stop and ask whether there are questions regarding this introduction. So the, there are currently no uh, question in the chat, but if anyone, uh, yes, there is a question by Alfonso, please. Alfonso? Uh, yeah. Hello. Um, my question is related with the, if there are uh, ecological explanation behind the fact that the parasite burden is distributed uh, like a negative binovial variable. Uh, Well, no, I would say that, well, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong. It's a, mostly an empirical, an empirical, um, an empirical remark that the negative, we know that, 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 that in most cases you have this um, over dispersion. Um, and so the negative binomial is, let's say, the simplest um, distribution that can describe over dispersion. Uh, well, well, let's say just... that, that that in a way, like the the story of the super spreaders, that you know, that like the the, the, the people that are super spreading uh, the same way in. You might have uh, supercharged, supercharged hosts. Um, uh, well, it also depends on your immune system, of course, because um, because when you count the parasites, that's the adult parasites that you count. And there are two ways: either you sacrifice the, uh, the host and uh, go and see what, how many parasites it is carrying. Um, Okay, or uh, you purge 
if it is an intestinal parasite, you purge. So clearly, um, the, the adult uh, also depends on the reaction of your immune system. So if your immune system is very, very active, so you might ingest a lot out of eggs, but the immune system is actually recognizing that there is a, uh, something going wrong in this react. And well, we know that the immune system in the different individuals responding in a, in a very different way. So I don't know whether this is really an explanation. Um, I would say that anyway, it's mostly an empirical observation. You have, you have many different um, okay cases like the one I showed to you at the very beginning, okay? And you say, well, uh, can, can I find something which is so flexible as to describe all these possible cases? In fact, you see that you go from K equal to six uh, to K equal to one, to K equal to 0.35, to K equal to 0.038. And you, so with a negative binomial, you succeed in, in describing uh, all uh, this, uh, variation of, of uh, okay. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I I think that this. Uh, I have another question, and it's related with the. We we are going to talk about uh, another models that account for different stages in the life cycle of the parasite more explicitly or yes, or yes, yes. Or... yes, yes. okay you mean that no i mean schistosomiasis you see is, is, is even more oh, yes. so i'm starting yes. from the simple okay. the simple life cycle this one on the on the right on the left and then now we are proceeding to uh the uh, actual life cycle of uh, in schistosomiasis where you have uh, two different hosts, okay? And then yes. okay, you can have even more complex uh, macro parasite life cycles with uh, uh, three hosts and, well, okay. Um, I think that Professor Rinaldo, for instance, might uh, speak of um, proliferative kidney disease in his uh, lecture where the, the life cycle is even a bit more complex, uh, okay? Thank you. Uh, well, well, oh, okay. So can I proceed to schistosomiasis then? I think yes. Yes, there are no other questions in the, yeah, please go ahead. So schistosomiasis um, is actually affecting many parts of the world mainly sub-Saharan Africa, um, a little bit in um, the Middle East and, and Far East uh, and South America. Uh, it affects um, uh, more than seven, uh, 700 million people, more than seven countries, in, um, at, at least potentially because they live in endemic areas. Um, more than 200 million people affected worldwide and every year there are several several tens of thousands of deaths that might be ascribed to schistosomiasis. And 90% of uh, global infections are found in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, uh, sorry, before going into that, um, now let me first of all show the schistosoma life cycle. And it is very similar to the one I showed to you for uh, fa uh, fasciolopsis. Well, the, um, consider uh, humans and then uh, humans are actually infected because they um, simply uh, contact in infested water, infected with cercaria. So the cercaria can actually penetrate through uh, the skin. Um, and then uh, the adult parasites will develop inside um, inside humans. Okay, and uh, they mate actually. So you have male and female. So you need a pair of, of, of um, actually parasites, and these um, will actually produce um, uh, schistosome eggs. 
and the schistosome X will develop into myracidia. This myracidia will infect snails of um, different uh, genera, Bionfolaria, Bulinus, Oncomelania. So Oncomelania is typical of schistosomiasis in, um, in, um, uh, in the Far East. And also the, the schistosoma is a little bit different. So you have schistosoma japonicum, uh, schistosoma mansoni, um, et cetera, schistosoma hematobium. And uh, the humans mainly will, will suffer uh, of urogenital or uh, intestinal uh, problems. Usually it is not a deadly disease per se, but anyway, it can contribute to uh, lethality very strongly. You can be infected several times. It's not that if you, if you get the, the disease that you will not get the disease again, you can get the disease. So you can get, be infected, reinfected. The, the treatment is simple, uh, but for uh, course poor countries, although it is simple, it might be expensive. Uh, and in practice, you have to take a, a vermifuge, uh, Pradiponto. Now we have mainly started um, uh, the problem of schistosomiasis in Senegal and uh, Burkina Faso. Well, uh, and we started that uh, a few years uh, a few years ago um, with the team of Professor Rinaldo and also with uh, our friends in, in Stanford and, um, um, and then other French people working in in, uh, in Senegal. So, uh, I will mainly talk of Senegal today. So first of all, let me show the local model that, that uh, you can make, and then we will proceed to consider a more complicated model where you have a network, a network of, of nodes. And um, first of all, you know, what's important that here you have uh, the mixture of the two approaches. You can recognize the uh, uh, negative binomial approach, uh, alpha being the mortality due to the uh, the parasites carried by the host. But now, uh, you know, you couple that with the snails. And in the case of, of the snails, they, they, you can treat that as a microparasitic disease. So you divide the snails into susceptible snails, exposed snails. So these are infected, but not yet infectious, and infectious snails. And so then you come out with a uh, five uh, differential equation where you have a number of human hosts, number of adult parasites, the density of susceptible snails, the density of exposed snails, and the density of infectious snails. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, And then again, you can make an, an approximation that we made the approximation we, we made in, in, in this paper that the number of circaria have very, that the circari have a very fast, um, a very fast dynamics. So you can suppose that the circaria, the number of circaria is simply proportional to the number of infectious snails. And the same for myrosidia, that myrosidia is simply proportional to the number of adult parasites. And if you do a bifurcation diagram, um, okay, you find out that after all, uh, what you can get is something which is very similar to what I showed to you, but for the case in which the parasite was affecting the reproductive success. In this case, no, the parasite is actually uh, affecting the, the mortality of, uh, of, uh, of humans. Uh, but in this case, in this more uh, complicated case with the uh, schistosomiasis uh, uh, model, then you have a transcritical bifurcation, a host bifurcation. You can study that in uh, a two-parameter space with human infection rate and the snail infection rate with two parameters. Um, so uh, in, in this case, you do the bi uh, bifurcation study uh, with respect to both parameters. And again, you get a... Um, a, a transcritical bifurcation, so you increase the human infection rate, increase the infection rate, and go through a transcritical bifurcation, you further increase both infection rates, and then you have half bifurcation uh, 
with this kind of, uh, of limit cycle. But the most interesting case is when you consider now a more uh, realistic, um, well, actually this is partially realistic, uh, meaning that uh, the value of the parameter will tune on the, on the Senegal and Burkina Faso case. But the most challenging uh, case was for, uh, came out for us in, um, in Senegal when um, uh, D4D, uh, uh, this challenge D4D uh, by Orange and uh, Sonatel data for development was um, launched. And in this case, uh, Orange is the you know, uh, mobile, mobile phone provider, uh, mobile phone connection provider. And um, Mm, uh, they uh, put anonymized uh, data on, um, on phone calls um, in, uh, available uh, to scientists and ask them, okay, choose a, a, a problem um, of a social, a social importance that you might want to solve using uh, our, our data. And then we decided to, uh, to use the, those data for um, developing a model for schistosomiasis um, in Senegal. You see that schistosomiasis, you can find um, urogenital schistosomiasis a little bit all over uh, Senegal. And um, especially uh, in the areas, especially in the rural areas, uh, clearly you're more subject to uh, schistosomiasis when you live close to water. Uh, so agricultural areas, you're uh, more exposed to, to schistosomiasis. Now, uh, so when you consider the network structure of the model, what do you need? Well, you need a uh, uh, high resolution population density that's uh, available via higher uh, geographical information systems. Then a human mobility flux system that um, uh, has been made available in a way by studying the um, phone calls in year uh, 2013. Then uh, people living in rural settings uh, and rivers, these are mo mostly ephemeral rivers. And then of course the, the data on the prevalence of uh, urogenital schistosomiasis. Now, uh, first, first of all, we had to study human mobility from uh, cell phone data. So it's big data. Uh, there are about 9 million Sonatel mobile phone users. And um, uh, well, at the beginning, uh, we're, uh, not, we were not given 9 million, actually 9 million um, users, um, but a smaller, smaller uh, sample. And then because we were winning the challenge for health, uh, uh, actually later on they provided us with 9 million, nine, really 9 million mobile phone users, not to name, of course they are anonymized and they're collected from one year. And so of course by uh, algorithm, you can um, uh, actually deduct mobility in a way, I don't go into the details, you can find the details in the for instance, in our paper, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's now very much used. Um, uh, well, of course, um, now remember one thing, these are mobile, these are not smartphone in general, so they, they don't have to have a GPS, global position system, but uh, you know, in a way, the position of, of the people by knowing the antenna to which they are connected in certain moment, okay. Now, uh, these are the, re the results of study mobility. So for instance, uh, it's, it's very clear, uh, there are two big festivals where uh, the Senegalese go uh, to, um, to city. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. The Grand Magal de Touba and the Kazuro Jab and in, in this very precise period, uh, okay. And uh, it's all, uh, and you can uh, really find them uh, easily. Uh, so for instance, this is mobility from Saint Louis, uh, a region that we have started, which is up to here. And of course, most of, of the people stay home the, uh, within region mobility, but then, uh, okay, they can move to other, uh, to other, to other uh, departments. Uh, and uh, here you see the Gamu de Tivawan, uh, 
Kezu Rajab and um, the Grand Magal de Tuba. Okay. So we are uh, rather confident that the, um, we can um, find mob uh, mobility in this way. Now, if you look at the model, it is uh, similar to the, the local model I showed to you, uh, but it, it's even more complicated um, because now we are also modeling uh, Circaria and Miracidia in each location I, and then not only that, but uh, the host in location high can, uh, they are also divided into a host carrying zero parasite, a certain number of parasites, the maximum number of parasites. So actually, you know, it, it's, uh, it's more complicated with host uh, having zero parasite and then be infected and getting one more parasite and so on and so on. And then, uh, Okay, the core, in a way, oh, I'm sorry. The core, of course, is the human mobility matrix because the, the disease is spread by people moving and uh, people moving and therefore they can have adult parasite uh, and then release uh, uh, the Miracidia somewhere else where they go or they go somewhere else get uh, infected in, uh, in, the, in the place where they do not live um, uh, usually and then come back and infect their home place. So, okay, so it, uh, it's complicated now because the force of infection and the rate uh, of fresh water contamination will depend on that matrix uh, Q, uh, Q. And so you have QIJ and QJI, I go to J, or uh, uh, coming back from J and going to I, okay? So exporting or importing uh, the, uh, the disease. So uh, you can now uh, run that model. Of course, part of the parameters are actually uh, known and a way measured, and some of these parameters have to be um, estimated. And so here are the results. The calibration is performed against the reported prevalence in each region, in each region. And here is, in a way, the fit. Uh, these are the prevalence data. These are this is the uh, prevalence calculated by the model. Of course, if it were perfect, you would stay on the 45 degrees line. Uh, but anyway, it's a reasonably good fit. Now, you can do a sensitivity analysis uh, with respect to the mobility of people. Uh, by mobile people, we mean the percentage of people that might move away from their own, from their own uh, region. Uh, of course, most of the people stay in their own region. Um, one of the, the uh, uh, 14 regions in which you can divide um, Senegal, uh, administrative region. And you see that the, um, okay, the prevalence uh, corresponding to the mobility that we estimated is actually more or less at the minimum. And then um, the average parasite burden is about seven, seven um, parasites per, per human. That's the average parasite burden. Now, when you have a model like that, then you can say, well, uh, what can I do? Can I, prevent the disease in some way. And there are different uh, intervention strategies that you can think of. So first of all, you might um, have a, a so-called wash strategies, water, sanitation, and hygiene, okay? And then information, education, and communication strategies. So you say, children, please be aware, don't go uh, play in, uh, in that river, in that canal, because that canal might be infested by snails. Snails will release circaria, the target can penetrate your skin. Or if you go there, wear boots, for instance. Well, difficult to think that children wear boots and gloves, but anyway, okay. Uh, and then uh, you can distinguish between uh, uh, what we call, um, Untargeted strategies, so you try to uh, ameliorate uh, sanitation everywhere in, in Senegal, or you can have uh, targeted strategies that might be prevalence targeted, where the prevalence is larger, then you uh, um, put more sanitation, or risk targeted. So, for instance, this that is a rural and um, water is scarce there, maybe, or depending on that. 
And you see that for WASH strategies, it is better to have uh, targeted strategies, while for information, education, and communication, well, it's rather intuitive, untargeted strategies, those strategies that are aimed at informing people all over the Senegal in a way are better in terms of reducing the average and the maximum prevalence. Now, give me five more minutes to say that then uh, we have also started um, uh, with people, to, with friends at Stanford uh, who carry a, a program on um, the region of Saint Louis, uh, which is located here near the Senegal River, the other part of Senegal at, at the border with Mauritania. And um, uh, that we are carrying on that uh, program uh, is also being financed by Politecnico de Milano, and there are you know a lot of lot of people actually collaborating. Uh, uh, um, with, uh, Amadou, I mean, uh, too, who also spent a period with us in uh, Politecnico, and then went back to to, and then um, uh, master students. Um, and then, um, the, for instance, Gilles Riveau, the epidemiologist, um, uh, who's actually doing the, the, the work in, in Senegal, Ibrahim Diallo, and uh, uh, Lamine, and so on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, by the way, that is a Professor Casagrande in Senegal. You know, he's wearing gloves and the boots, of course, and this is Lamine, I think, I'm not sure. Okay, they are wearing uh, boots uh, and, and gloves because it would be very dangerous to, to, to go there because you see the, the small snails, these are the small snails that are releasing the circaria. Now, in this case, we went more in details because you see there are villages, okay, the triangles, phone antennas, but they're not all located in villages. Some of them are located in between the villages. And then the sample points, and then the water point, the water points. So, you know, we developed a more complicated, uh, more complicated model where you have several connection matrices because you have some matrices describing the probability that the snail or the circaria or a, a, or a mir miracidium moves between any two water points using the hydrological network which it didn't use for the whole Senegal, actually. The antenna to antenna mobility matrix. Then uh, the, uh, another matrix describing the village to antenna movement. Uh, well, not really movement, but you, you, you see you have to decide that that village is actually connected to that antenna or another antenna. And then another matrix describing the proximity of water points to antennas. Okay, so it's a complicated. So we introduce all that. And then we, uh, uh, so this model now includes several transportation uh, mechanisms. And we, we, we found a reasonably good agreement with prevalence data in people. Unfortunately, prevalence can be very high um, um, all over especially um, along the, um, this lake um, and also the canal and then the river. It can, it can mean, you know, uh, in some um, places, the children might have, the 80% of the children might have blood in their urine. So it's really, uh, you know, a, a big problem in, uh, in rural areas. And uh, I hope that in this way, we have somehow contributed to the fight against the schistosomiasis. And um, well, I think that's the end uh, of my time. But of course, if there are questions, I'm willing to answer. And uh, of course, I would like to, to answer your questions. Yes, so there is a, uh, indeed a question from the chat. Um, how do you account for the infection occurring somewhere else, but reported in the uh, patient home? For instance, infection happening in San Louis, but reported in Dakar. In Dakar, no, the infection that are, are reported, uh, they, they, the infection of course are reported at home, because these are actually, if I well remember, 
the so-called uh, these are the so, uh, sanitary department and these are the regions so uh, of course usually you get sick uh, at home i mean if you if you, if you travel then uh, okay so you can make that approximation so you, uh, you you report home but then if you go to the um, of course to um, you can get um, well you stay you are each host um, stays in uh, a location i which is the home and uh, the home is actually how how do you find the home of uh, a, a phone user well usually most of the time the phone calls at evening the most frequent um, phone calls at evening are usually attributed to home. So you can say what well, that one of those uh, 9 million users that that the home is this one. And then usually uh, he or she gets sick at home. Okay, so they're attributed to home, but they can get the infection somewhere else. So they might go somewhere else, be infested by Sertaria somewhere else, and they come home and uh, well, usually they re release Miracidia in their own uh, water body or sewage system. Okay, so that, yeah, that's the information. Yes, there is a um, partially related question, which is uh, in the last part, how do you account for under reporting, under reporting in prevalence data? Well, okay, the data on prevalence um, were directly uh, collected by Gilles Ribou. Okay, so it was careful. So, uh, by Gilles and Lamine. Gilles and Lamine were actually conducting their own, uh, at least in Saint Louis, in Saint Louis. They were conducting their own uh, campaign uh, looking at the prevalence. So the prevalence I have showed, I have shown to you, this one is, is actually the prevalences that were measured. So we are rather, um, well, let's say, hopefully under reporting is not so high at this part of the region. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, um, there is no uh, other question in the chat. Uh, if you um, have any, if anyone has any question, please uh, raise a hand with the tool you are, I'm sure, now familiar with. Um, Okay, uh, I don't think there is uh, any other uh, question. Oh, everything very clear or very obscure. No, uh, the, there is another question uh, about how uh, and try to interpret it is how about um, uh, how did you infer mobility from the phone uh, record? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, as, as I told you, um, okay, uh, now there are very, very, very many algorithms around um, to reduce probability from phone calls. Now, of course, if these were smartphones and um, the GPS were on the global positioning system, that uh, would be uh, in a way easy to like. Um, in this case, um, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that you, you don't have always to use a smartphone, but you can use a normal uh, mobile. And, and maybe you have a smartphone, but you, you don't uh, switch on the, the GPS, the global position system, um, because you don't want to be located uh, in, in any minute of your life. So in this case, you know, um, it is the antennas that we know. So we know that uh, um, in, uh, 
one of, of the users at a certain precise moment was connected to a certain antenna. And of course, the density of the antenna is not the same all over Senegal and not all over Italy or all over France or everywhere, because uh, of course there are more antennas in urban settings uh, and uh, uh, fewer antennas in a, in a rural setting. So, for instance, if you go to uh, Saint Louis, uh, these are the uh, location of, of the antennas. So you see that sometimes they are close to a village, and, and sometimes they're not even close to a village. Um, uh, also, it, it might it might be possible, you know, that there are many antennas at the border with Mauritania. Okay. That probably because they 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 are uh, trying to not have people connected to antennas in Mauritania, okay, or something like that. Anyway, so what um, uh, now? Uh, um, so first of all, there's there's a problem that you have to attribute antennas to uh, villages, for instance. Okay, and you can do that by uh, the usual algorithms that, that are also used by hydrologists. Uh, that, uh, where uh, they have to reconstruct, for instance, the uh, rain precipitation and so on. Okay, so uh, for instance, uh, they use the polygon method or uh, something like that. Okay, first problem. Then uh, you can attribute um, home to uh, the place, uh, or you should say the antenna, and then uh, the village, uh, uh, where you connect most frequently in the evening get that that the assumption okay and then of course you can reconstruct you, you for a certain user you can strike the different antennas through which the user is going in different uh, uh, at different times okay so home and then uh, so these guys stay uh, usually here and then uh, well I will see that uh, uh, corresponds with the Grand Magal de Tuba, he's there. Okay, because the, the using the phone and uh, and that, that phone is not connected to the home antenna, but it is connected to, to the antenna close to, to the Grand Magal de Tuba. Okay, and then uh, he or she will come back home. Okay. And so therefore, this is the way that you can reconstruct, uh, for instance, uh, all, uh, all this. And then, of course, the, we uh, because, and then we took the averages to describe um, the yearly the yearly uh, mobility in a way. But you can do more than that. You might run the model not on a yearly basis, but uh, also on a daily basis. On a, I don't know whether it would make sense because it would be too huge and uh, the epidemiological data are not so detailed. Okay, hope I, I'm sorry, I think time for the next uh, speaker probably. Yes, I think we are perfectly on time. So uh, thanks again to uh, Marino Gatto for giving this uh, fantastic lecture. So uh, next, next lecture is gonna be about uh, again models in disease ecology, but applied to uh, COVID-19. Um, so yes, it will be on Wednesday, that right yeah. Yes, let me check uh, on, uh, yes, it will be on uh, Wednesday to third Italian time. So uh, thanks again, Marino. And uh, what we're going to do is to take um,